Hello everyone and welcome to the first video of what I like to call the calculus corner. In this corner we're going to tackle problems in the field of calculus because I believe it is very essential for many many fields in engineering. Today we're going to talk about limits of functions. I'm Gus and this is Endless Engineering so let's dive right in. So let me start out first by talking about what a function is. So imagine that you have a set of numbers called x and you have another set of numbers called y and these numbers essentially are have a relationship with each other. There's a relationship that says given any number from set x then I can give you the matching number for it in set y. And that's essentially what a function is. A function f of variable x where x is a variable that lives or belongs to the set capital X is essentially a mapping from set x to set y. And these two sets are typically called the domain and the range of the functions. And so y here is equal to f of x. Typically, x is referred to as the independent variable, or sometimes the argument of the function. It could also be referred to as the input. y is the dependent variable, or the output of the function. And that's basically it. So a function is just a relationship that maps numbers from one set to exactly another number in another set. And the notation f of x is typically read as the function of x, basically, or f of x. So let's look at an example for this. So example number one, we have y is equal to f of x, which is equal to 2 times x. Right? So let's say x here, it belongs to the set of real numbers, right? So if I were to write this down, I can say x here and put a value for y equal to 2x, right? So x, if x was minus 1, this would be minus 2. If x was 0, this would be 0. If x was 1, this would be 2, right? And I can go on and list some uh, other values. So this is one way to look at a function, which is to tabulate the inputs and the outputs of the function, essentially. Another way to look at a function is to graph it. So this function here, I can see that at 0, the value is 0. If this was, you know, x and y, I can see at 1, the value is 2, right? Uh, so this is 2 here, and this is 1 here. This is not exactly the scale, but you get the idea. At negative 1, it's negative 2. And essentially, it's a, oops, it's actually supposed to be a straight line. So my function has to go through all the three points. All right, so this is a straight line with a slope 2. That's what this function is. Another example could be that y is equal to x squared. Right? This is a quadratic function. And this quadratic function, if I do the same thing here for it, and I tabulate and look at the values, I can see that for minus 2, the value is 4. For minus 1, the value is 1. For 1, the value is 1. And for 2, the value is 4. So you can see here that in this case, the variable x belongs to all the real numbers, but y belongs to the set of positive real numbers. And that's because it's a quadratic. And if we were to, if we were to draw this function out, let me just section this out here and try to draw it here. If we were to draw, you know, x squared and x, you'll see that it looks something like a well like this, right? It's quadratic. So it is symmetric around the x-axis in this case, and it has these values that correspond to this. So these are two examples of a function, which is a relationship that maps one set to another set. Let's take a look at another example function where the function can be defined in a piecewise definition. So let's look at an example of a piecewise defined function. And by that I mean the function has a definition dependent on the range of the variable x that it has. 
In this case, we have a function f of x that is equal to 2x when x is between minus 1 and, minus in, and infinity. And these are open sets. And it's also x squared when x is greater than negative infinity and equal to minus 1. So what does that mean? If we look at a graph of this function, we'll have x here and f of x here, or we could say y, right? In this case, let's look at this part right here. So up until negative 1, uh, oh, sorry, in the x, not in the y. Up until negative 1 in the x, right, this function is this line. So at negative 1 in the x, this is equal to negative 2, right? That's where this function ends. And it's not equal to that. This is an open, uh, this is not equal to it. So from this point forward, this you get this function with this slope all the way to infinity. The slope is 2. Now at this point, the function directly jumps to a value of the quadratic which is equal to 1 at this point. So this is a closed circle here, so that means that the function, when the function is at negative 1, it evaluates with the squared term, and if you had the squared going through, I hope I draw this correctly, it will look something like this, right? So this is the quadratic term of the function, and this is the linear term of the function. If the function was totally quadratic, it would look something like this, right? It would have this value here, and then it would, on the other side, be symmetric like we showed earlier. And if the function was completely linear, it would be this line that goes all the way from negative infinity to infinity. However, in this case, the function is piecewise defined. That means it's different pieces based on the different range of the value of x. And in this case, this, this, the, 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 the discriminating value is negative 1, where it's not equal to it on this line, but it actually is here. And this is actually something that we encounter a lot in calculus, where we have functions that have these jumps, right, or these changes. And we'll talk about that in upcoming videos, and we'll talk about the importance of this concept and how it affects uh, different concepts in calculus as well. So now that we've introduced the notion of a function and how it works, we can talk about the limit of a function. And the limit is a very important concept in calculus. What we're going to talk about today is kind of an intuitive way to define a limit. So let me start the discussion by asking you, if there was a hiker trying to climb Mount Everest, let's say that Mount Everest looks something like this, and this is x, the distance that the, tra the hiker travels, assuming, you know, it's 2D, we're taking a slice of Mount Everest, Mount Everest, and the peak of the mountain is at hp, value of hp, it doesn't matter what it is. 1800 meter kilometers. So the hiker is moving up along this function that describes the uh, mountain of Everest, right? So when do you say that she got to the peak, right? Well, you can say, oh, well, if she got to a value of 90%, 99%, well, you could just say, well, I guess if she gets to close enough, to that number, then we're good. But how do you define close enough? And we're going to do that by saying that f of x, which is this function right here, minus hp, take the absolute value of that. So this is sort of the distance, right? f of x minus hp should be less than some epsilon, where here we can say epsilon is a small positive number. So essentially, epsilon is greater than zero, right? So you'll say, okay, if the hiker gets epsilon close to the peak, then she has conquered Everest. I say, great. I say, then, what's the value of x there? Let's call that value here x peak, right? So if I say x minus x peak should be greater than zero and less than delta, where delta here is also greater than zero, a small positive number, then I've effectively defined the limit. This is the limit of the function. So I can say more mathematically that for all values of epsilon, if there exists a delta such that f of x 
minus h peak absolute is less than epsilon and x minus x peak is less than delta and greater than zero, then, then, and only then, the limit of f of x as x goes to x peak is equal to h peak. This is the formal definition of the limit of a function, and we defined it in an intuitive way. Let me go over it one more time. We have a hiker, she's climbing Mount Everest, and Mount Everest has a certain shape or a function, as a function of the distance she travels along the ground, x. And she wants to get to h peak, right? The height or altitude of the peak. Now, if we say she got to epsilon distance, a very small distance, but still positive, from this h peak, then she's done it. And she can only do that when she gets to, you know, x, the variable, close enough to x peak such that this difference here is greater than zero and less than delta. Because the closer I get to x peak, this distance keeps smaller and smaller. I never go over x peak. That's why this is never ne negative. It's always greater than zero. But I'm getting close enough. Then I can say, if these, if all values of epsilon, for all values of epsilon, there exists a delta such that these two conditions are satisfied, then the limit can be defined for this function. And in this case, the limit is hp. So you can think of the limit intuitively as the value the function approaches or becomes when the variable approaches a certain value itself, right? And that is essentially the definition of the limit. And it's a very important definition, and it's a very important concept in calculus when we'll see in other videos. So let's look at an example of a limit of a function and how that can help us graph that function or plot that function. So take, for example, a sigmoid function. f of x is equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x. This function shows up in a lot of biological modeling of systems. It shows up also in a lot of machine learning applications and other engineering applications. And what I want to do here is I want to graph this function. Now, if you don't know how this function looks like, then you might be intimidated looking at it. Oh, it's got an exponential in the denominator with a negative number. But let's see if we can leverage the concept of a limit intuitively to graph this function. So let's look at this function's limit as x goes to infinity, first of all. right? Because x can be any value of real number. So... Now, the one in the numerator and the one in the denominator are constants. They're never going to change. It doesn't matter. Let's look at this value. What happens to this value as x tends to infinity? So this is a exponential to the negative x. So that means that the larger x is, the smaller this term is. And as x grows infinitely large, this term goes to 0 because it becomes 1 over infinity. And so that is, by definition, 0. So this is 1 over 1, and this becomes 1. Right? So the limit of a, a sigmoid as x goes to infinity is 1. How about the limit as x goes to minus infinity? What is that uh, of, of 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x? Right? Same function. So this term right here, the negative and the negative become positive. So this term, as x grows in the negative direction, will grow larger. So this goes to infinity. So this becomes 1 over 1 plus infinity. And 1 over infinity is 0. It's defined mathematically as 0. So now we know two things. If we were to make a plot of this sigmoid, we know that infinity is somewhere over here, minus infinity is somewhere over here on the x-axis. We know that the sigmoid will somehow tend to the value of 1 at infinity and 0 at minus infinity. Great. So let's look in between. What happens at 0? Right? What is the limit of the sigmoid as x goes to 0? So when this term goes to 0, what happens? This becomes 1, right? So it's 1 over, sorry, this is no, 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x, so this becomes 1 over 
1 plus 1, which becomes 1 half. So now we know this is the value 1, this is the value 1 half. We know in between it's 1 half. So we know that somehow this function goes from infinity of being 0, passes through 0.5, and then at infinity becomes 1. And that's a sigmoid function. Now in between, we don't exactly know the values, but it's definitely not a linear term. So we can't just draw a line to infinity and a line to infinity. We know that there's an exponential factor to it, so we got to use our in mathematical intuition. But we know that this function would be defined using the limits at infinity to be 1 and at minus infinity to be 0. And you can go ahead and as an exercise look at its value, you know, at minus 1, minus 2, 1, 2, and try to you know, practice intuitively what the limit value would be and maybe put those dots on this here and connect them together and look at what the sigmoid function looks like. And with that, we can end the first video of the Calculus Corner where we discussed functions and how they work. We've also discussed the concept of a limit and we've mathematically defined it. Hopefully in the future we will use this concept to build up on our understanding of the field of calculus. I hope you've enjoyed this video and if you did, hit the thumbs up button. I appreciate your support and thank you so much for watching.